today's uh, message is the armor of God. And this is really a, an important message for us to um, think about today as we, um, as we go through this life, as we get ready for the um, second coming of Jesus Christ. So most of us here today have never been to war. I know that my grandparents, um, they uh, went through the war, uh, World War II. Um, but most of us, you know, we've seen wars and we've heard of wars, but not a lot of us, you know, have actually participated in wars. Now, I know I was in Desert Storm, and uh, I know that um, there's others that were involved, but for me, I wasn't really involved in the fighting. I was more of a support um, function. But um, when you think of being in a war, you think of being in a hand-to-hand -hand combat, you think of, you know, having a, a physical confrontation. But um, while it's true that most of us haven't really been in that kind of a, of a battle, you know, where we've had to engage the enemy directly, um, all of us are engaged in a battle here that has been raging since the time that it came you know, to the human race, when Satan was cast out of heaven and, um, and Adam and Eve had, um, had fallen. And so all those who accept Christ as their Savior have enlisted on the side of Christ. And that when you enlist on the side of Christ, you're, in essence, putting yourself at enmity with the powers of darkness of this world. And you put a target on your back as a Christian. And so if we are to stand firm to gain the victory in this battle, you know, we need to be equipped for battle that is at hand. I know that when I was in the military, one of the things that, you know, they, they would always equip you very well with, you know, some basic things that you need. Uh, one of the things that they gave you was a Kevlar helmet uh, at my time, and I was watching Sean as he was getting ready for his drill last week, uh, putting together his Kevlar helmet, and I noticed that uh, his helmet was a lot more comfortable than mine was back in Desert Storm. And uh, they give you a flak jacket, they give you a weapon, they give you a, we call it an LDE at the time, but it's, uh, it's a place to carry your, your ammo, your canteens, your, you know, basically, you know, all of the things that you need as you go into battle. And one of the um, mo most important things that they give you is uh, a pair of boots. And, you know, those boots, uh, when I got them, weren't all that comfortable, but they were certainly rugged and they protected your feet in the terrain that we're in. Nowadays, they have boots that are you know, much more comfortable and they're very similar to tennis shoes, but they're very rugged and they, they protect as well. So, you know, as the, you know, as being in the military, they arm you and equip you with, with armor. Um, God also doesn't leave us defenseless. He gives us an armor that is to be put on. Now, of course, we have our guardian angels to, to be there to protect us, but this is a spiritual battle. It's not necessarily physical things that are going to happen to us. And so this spiritual armor that he gives us is what we're going to study about today. So the reason why there are so many today that are not strong in the Lord is because they have not put on the whole armor of God. They have been deceived into battling an enemy in their own strength. Their, their, their armor is an armor of their own making. So I'd like you to turn with me, if you will, to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And this is what, and actually, you know what, I'd like um, Sister Marie, if you can unmute yourself and, and read that for us. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days, can't see perilous, perilous. perilous time for men will be lovers of themselves lovers of money boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful unholy unloving unforgiving slanderers without self-control brutal despisers of good traitors headstrong haughty lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of god having a form of godliness 
but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Now, notice what we're reading here there, in, and thanks for reading, Marie. Um, when you're reading this, um, this text here, this is talking about certain characteristics that, you know, on the, you know when you really look at it, they're, they're, they're evil traits. They're certainly not traits of Christ. And we think uh, that at this time that they're speaking about the worldly or the ungodly. But at the, in verse 5, it says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, says from such turn away. And so what this is talking about, these traits that are being brought out in these people, is really looking into their hearts, what their true character is like. And it calls it to having a form of godliness. Now, I, have, um, I also like to use the New Living Translation, and, and I'm going to read from you verse 5 in 2 Timothy 3, verse 5. It says this, They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. And so in a very clear way, it is telling us that there, in the last days, there are going to be a lot of people that um, act like they're religious. They, um, they, you know, they, they, they put this pretense that they're holy and righteous, but in reality, in their hearts, they are just like those traits, traitors, heavy, high-minded, false accusers, in constant meaning, without self-control, and um, yeah, proud and boastful. Now, if you put this in the context of the armor of God, these people have this armor that they put on that on the outside looks like the armor of God, but in reality is it's a counterfeit armor. It's not the armor of God. So that when they are tested, these traits of characters that they have come out because this armor has no ability to protect them. And so today we are going to take a look at how God equips us with his armor. What are the characteristics? What is it about our, um, the armor that God gives us that protects us? And it helps us to identify the true versus the false armor that God, uh, or that is out there. And so we're going to begin today, and we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. And so turn to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be there most of the time. We're going to kind of go to a few texts afterwards. Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to begin with verse 10. And I'm going to ask um, Brother Mike, since we are unmuted, why don't you go ahead and read uh, verse 10 and 11. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and, and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the, the wiles of the devil. All right. So, you know, one of the, one of the ways that um, I think the New Living Translation puts it against the um, uh, devices or the um, strategies of, what was that you were saying? The schemes, yes, of the enemy. So, really, uh, it begins with really where this armor comes from. He says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord. And so what it means is, is that we're not to be strong in our own strength. We are to be strong in the Lord. Our strength must come from the Lord and in the power of his might rather than our might. You know, most of the time when we try to, you know, overcome these temptations or these things that we are um, trying to overcome, you know, whether it be you know, something that we're eating, something that we're doing, something that we're watching, you know, we, we try to do it in our own strength. You know, we, we basically sit there and say, okay, you know what, I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do that. And so in the book of James chapter 4, verse 7, it really has um, the, uh, a principle there that we can, we can hold on to. So James 4, verse 7 says this, Submit yourself, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee, flee from you. And so it's in essence saying the very same thing that um, Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, submit yourself therefore unto God. And be strong in the Lord and the power of his mind. So it's really identifying where the source of this um, armor comes from, where the source of our power is to come from. And it's to come from God through his son, Jesus Christ. So let me ask yourselves, why is it that we need armor? Why is it that we need to have this um, this armor um, put on? Well, it go, it, the reason is, is because armor is a protection against the wiles and the strategies and the trickery of the devil. So Satan's most uh, effective 
um, weapons against us is not it, it physically. Now, obviously, you know, there, he physically can't hurt us, but um, that's not his most effective weapon. His most effective weapon is his ability to deceive us, his ability to trick us and to get us to think one thing when we should be thinking about another. So, yeah, it's indirect. And that's why he calls it a spiritual battle. And, uh, you know, our angels are there to protect us from a lot of the physical maladies that, uh, that he wants to throw against us. But um, we need this armor of God. So let's go ahead and let's continue on in reading. So um, I'm going to ask Sister Darlene, and then the next time I ask someone to read, it'll be uh, Brother Romy. So uh, Sister Darlene, if you can read verse 12. Uh, Ephesians 6, verse 12. I'm sorry. Ephesians 6, 12. Okay. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So what it's saying here is that our battle is against a, an enemy that we cannot see. And when it uses the word wrestling, wrestling... Uh, is, is different from, you know, having an argument with someone. Wrestling is, it's, it's like a hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's very personal. It's very uh, intimate. And it's, and it's one against another. And so that's the picture that Paul is, uh, is putting it. Now, when I was in the Army um, and I was supporting the frontline people, the, the battle that they were battling against was, you know, you had a lot of the Bradley fighting vehicles. You had the A-1 Abrams tanks and stuff. And so they were able to uh, overcome the enemy very quickly and very easily because their weapons were superior to the weapons you know, of the enemy. And, uh, and that's really kind of the same thing it is today, is the weapons of Satan is far superior to anything that we, in and of ourselves, um, can do. So we... Uh, by ourselves are overcome very quickly. But God gives us a weapon that even Satan can't overcome. Now think about this. Who is the only human being that Satan has not overcome? That is Jesus Christ himself. He became a man and he's the only one that Satan has not overcome. And so therefore the armor that, uh, that Christ had was the righteousness that came from his father, his own righteousness, because he was the only begotten Son of God. And that righteousness in human flesh that has been tested in battle against the arch enemy is the same armor that he wants to give to us. It's Christ's righteousness that he gives us. Now, think about this. I used to study the, uh, I, when I'd look in the Bible, I said, um, would look into Ephesians chapter 6 and study the, the armor of God. I would always, I would look at each piece and say, wow, how does this, benefit me? What is this really? How do I take this on upon myself? And for some time, I did not realize that the, the whole armor of God simply is the righteousness of Christ. Now, the, the different, you know, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and the, the breastplate of righteousness, all these things that we're going to talk about here in a second, they are parts of this armor. But in its totality, it is talking about the righteousness of Christ. And that's the beautiful thing, is that what God gives us is he gives us his son's own righteousness, a righteousness that um, is more than a match for Satan. And that, you know, if we have this armor on, there's, Satan is powerless against us. And so what Satan tries to do is to do everything he can to let us, uh, to help, for us to let go of our faith in the son of God. He's doing everything that he can. Now, one of the things that he's done is he's introduced a counterfeit armor, a counterfeit righteousness. And we find, in, uh, we find the, the results of this counterfeit righteousness in the message to the Laodiceans, you know, where it says, uh, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Um, and it says, buy of me gold tried in the fire and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy naked is not be seen, and I salve that thou mayest see. And so the condition of the church of Laodicea, the end time, the remnant people, is that they are, they have accepted a uh, righteousness 
that is not the righteousness of Christ, but the righteousness of a counterfeit, a false Christ, which Christ had been warning his disciples about. And so when we talk about this wrestling against flesh and blood, against the principalities, uh, against the powers and the rulers of darkness of this world, is talking about a spiritual battle that we are in, is that we're in a spiritual battle that um, we cannot fight unless we have the armor, the whole armor of God. And that comes when we surrender our lives fully to Christ. That's the beautiful thing. Um, Brother Romy, I'm going to ask you to uh, maybe comment if you want at this point. And then uh, when you're done commenting, you can read uh, Ephesians 6, 13, and 14 for us. I'm going to read now? Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah. Verse, verse 13. 13 or 14? Both of them. Verse 13 says that uh, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Amen. Go ahead and comment on that if you will. Yeah, uh, actually if we go back to the uh experience of the apostle paul we can read that he went through this experience also in his life if we go to the book of romans chapter 7 we will read about how he struggled against such kind of uh, against against such kind of uh, uh battle that he went through and he says that uh but we're not going to read the whole of chapter 7. I'm just going to give some highlights with regards to it because it uh, talks about how he experienced this battle that we're talking about. And it's against uh, the law that is in his flesh and the law of the commandments of God. And, said, uh, and he said that uh, he cannot do the things that uh, he knows that are good that he wants to do and all the things that he knows that are bad that's those are the things that he was doing so it's uh in contrary to what his mind wants to do because the power of the flesh which is sinful is in his uh, flesh in his body and he has been going through a struggle with it uh, his mind says that uh, I want to do that something that is good, but I cannot do it because the power of evil, the power of sin is in his less and it's more stronger. That's why he experienced this kind of battle, he experienced this kind of struggle in his life. But look at what his uh, answer was. In verse 24 of uh, Romans chapter 7, chapter 7, verse 24 and 25, he says that, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? From the body of this death because his body is uh, being controlled by the power of sin. And sin brings death. And so his answer was in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. So... When he was going through this kind of struggle, he found out that the answer is through the strength of his Lord, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so how does that, how can that be possible? Because in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 16, he says, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. And so he found the answer to his struggle. He found the answer to his problem against sin, that it is true only, just like what we've been reading in the book of Ephesians, 
that it is only through the power of uh, Jesus Christ that he, he was able to overcome uh, all these uh, uh, struggles in his experiences in life. And so, in, if we go back to the book of Ephesians, the first, the first armor that he uh, stated is stand there for having your loins girt about with truth. So our loins is the is the place where our uh, in our body where the upper body and the lower body meets. It is actually in the waist. If our loins, if our waist is weak, the tendency is we cannot stand straight. That we cannot stand straight. That's why that was his first statement that we need to gird our loins with the truth. If our body is strong, we can stand straight, meaning we can stand righteous in our life. And so that's what he is stating in verse 14 that if we gird our loins in our spiritual battle in our spiritual uh, loins if we gird it with the truth of the word of god then we will be able to stand straight uh, and strong in our battle against uh, the rulers of evil and so if we are able to stand strong and right and having on the breastplate of righteousness that's the only way and he was able he was able to uh, obtain the answer to his question that it was only through the strength of his Lord Jesus Christ that he was able he was able to stand uh, righteous stand true to stand straight in his battle against this uh, struggle that he went through amen amen and uh, you know I noticed that you you use Romans chapter 7 you know talking about this um, you know, this battle with the old man of sin and that, you know, where it says, oh, wretched man that I am, you know, and you, exactly what you said is that we struggle with that. You know, we, you know, we, we, we do that which we don't want to do, right? We want to be, do things that are right, but, you know, but our nature, you know, it just controls us and we do that which we don't want to do. But he is, you're right. He said he got the victory. And if, and if we read in, Romans chapter 8 we just read a few more verses it says there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit mm -hmm. for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And so this Amen. is talking about walking after the spirit, after accepting Christ as our savior and how he then comes in and transforms us. And I, I like how you had, you had expanded a little bit about how, you know, our loin area is what helps us to stand up straight. But mm -hmm. adding to that um, is that, loins is really kind of an um it's our midsection and it's an old english way um you know of saying belt when it comes to armor is that a belt is what holds the armor together and what was the belt that holds it all together and holds the whole armor together is truth now i looked in this and what it says in the in the sda commentary and a few other sources and it says that truth is more than just personal honesty it is the truth about God. Our understanding of God, uh, who God is, holds together the whole armor. Jesus said in uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so what holds this whole armor together is the truth that God is the one true God, and he reveals himself to us through his Son. So our understanding of who God is is what holds together the whole armor of God. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the blessed breastplate of righteousness. Well, the breastplate was designed to protect the heart of the believer. 
Righteousness mm-hmm. preserves the life of the believer and it protects the vital organs. Now you think about this, how does righteousness protect us? Well, when we are righteous, when we have a righteous nature, when we are submitted to Christ and we move away from the things of this world. Now, granted, this process is not always instantaneous. It takes some time. But the more that we um, partake of the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness in our own lives, where we decide, you know what, I'm not going to go down to the bars and I'm not going to drink. You know, I, there was this one time where I had a, um, um, a discussion with, you know, with my brother-in-law and I was drinking. So we'd both been drinking and, you know, he's Catholic. I'm, I'm quote, supposed to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And, uh, you know, I started to tell him about the Sabbath and how the Sunday was the wrong day. And he kind of let me have it. And, you know, I was very easily overcome because I certainly was not wearing the breastplate of righteousness. My life did not say that I was righteous. I was in, I was in open sin, and I was trying to preach Christ. And I, re- I would recommend nobody do that because, you know, it, <laughs> it's certainly not going to work. Um, I remember trying to share with this one person going, uh, that was going to start going to a, a Sunday-keeping church, you know, Harvest Baptist, and I shared with him all the texts about how the seventh day is the Sabbath. And the one, and you know, he was, was, he, he was kind of convinced about what I was saying because I was using the text straight from the Bible. But then he asked me what day I worshiped on. And at that point, I wasn't going to church. I wasn't worshiping on the seventh day Sabbath. I was going out and doing like I normally would do on any regular day. And because of that, my witness was, um, was tainted, you know, If we're partaking of sin, uh, it puts us at risk uh, of falling into temptation, right? If I'm an alcoholic and I'm trying to, you know, and I have this urge to drink alcohol and I go into a bar, but I'm just going in there to get a glass of water or a glass of orange juice, that's not the best thing to do, right? Or let's say I decided I'm going to be a designated driver. That certainly is not the best place for me to be. So if we are acting righteously, we are putting our, and we are, we are separating ourselves from the things that will lead us into sin, whatever that sin is. Um, I would say that, you know, the, the movies that we watch can certainly lead us into sin. Um, I think the Bible says somewhere, and I haven't really prepared this text, but it says, uh, it talks about that we're not to take pleasure in unrighteousness. And that's really what we're doing when we watch television you know, murders and you know, rapes. And, you know, even though we're rooting for the good guy to overcome the bad guy and to get this guy and put him into jail or to shoot him, or whatever the case may be, we're taking pleasure in unrighteousness. And if you notice, uh, if you watch TV a little bit, you start to notice that um, we start to root for the, the bad guy because they highlight the bad guy as somebody that's cool and you know, it's the focus of it. Um, it's just the way that these things are. But if we have the breastplate of righteousness, if we are walking after Christ, we are avoiding many traps that Satan wants to, to give us. Because those traps are more heavily laid out in the world than they are in the church. Now, I will say that those traps are also in the church. And they're also in wholesome things. But um, when we put ourselves in a righteous situation when we're following after Christ we are protected against um, making those kinds of mistakes that being led into temptation so the breastplate protects our heart and it is our heart that God is the trying to change right as um, he said um, you know the heart is deceitful above all things desperately wicked who can know it Jeremiah 17 verse 9 and so what we need is a new heart. I think it says in Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart also will I give thee, a a new spirit will I give thee. And so I'm kind of paraphrasing this a bit, but God wants to give us a new heart. He wants to give us a new spirit. And when he gives that new spirit to us in the, in the, when we accept Christ as our savior, that needs to be protected. And that protection comes from the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So, Uh, We're going to move on a little bit here, and um, we're going to move on to uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 
uh, 15. And um, Kathy, if you're there, can you go ahead and read Ephesians 6, 15? Okay, uh, we can't hear you. You gotta, you're gonna have to unmute yourself. Sorry, sister. <laughs> Forgot. Okay. Yeah. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Yeah, so it's interesting. You know, I've also always tried to really understand this. And in the old, um, in the King James version, it talks about your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And so you think shod? What does that mean? It really means it's, it's talking about a protective covering that goes over your feet. Now, you remember I talked about um, in the military, they give you a set of boots. We call them leather personnel carriers. And those boots were to protect your feet. Now, I remember one time I was, we were giving um, in the training and one of the sergeants came up and he talked about how we need to take care of our feet as a soldier. Because um, when you're in battle, there's not always time to, um, to you know, take care of your feet. And a lot of times we take our feet for granted. But you know, we have to take care of our feet because if you get blisters on your feet or if you get a wound on your feet, then it affects, it affects everything else. Your ability to fight is greatly diminished because you're not able to stand, you're not able to run, you're not able to do the things that you're uh, required to do. And so we need to protect our feet to shot it. Now notice this, with the preparation for the gospel of peace. So what does this really mean? You know, Brother, Brother Romy, why don't you go ahead and you can talk a little bit about it and then I'll, I'll comment after that. Yes. <clears throat> when it says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, you have just stated that a shod is something that protects the feet. So we can apply this to sandals or shoes yep. because they are used to protect our feet when we go and have a walk everywhere we go we walk we use our feet and so we need to have a protection in our feet in order that our feet should not be uh what you call it, be hurt but it says here that with the preparation of the gospel of peace meaning to say that we should always have a protection anywhere we go anywhere we go we always need to have a protection we should always be prepared we should always be prepared wherever we go with the gospel of peace and what is that peace that is talking about here it is the peace of god it is the peace of understanding uh, it is the peace that makes us right with god and with his son jesus christ and if we have this kind of peace a peace that is in harmony with God, with His Son, Jesus Christ, we will be able to live and we will be able to bring this gospel of peace anywhere we go. We will become peaceful to everyone, not because of us, because there is no true peace in us, but because we are bringing the peace of God, the peace of Jesus Christ, wherever we may go. And this would be seen this will be manifested exemplified and revealed in us in our life wherever we may go because we have that as a protection in our feet uh, wherever we may go we will have that uh, uh, what you call gospel of peace the peace that passes all understanding it is a peace that is in harmony with god it is a, it is a peace that is in harmony with jesus christ with his truth. And so this is the kind of peace that we need to bring anywhere we go. This is the kind of peace that we should put on as a protection in us, in our feet, wherever we may go, so that we may be able to reveal, to manifest in our life who God is and who Jesus is. Amen. Thank you for that, brother. You know, when, it, when you talk about footwear, um, if you're wearing footwear, it's because you're advancing upon the enemy. And in fact, that's what God wants us to do, is that we're to take this message to the whole world. This is not something that we're supposed to keep to ourselves. And so uh, if, you, if you turn into the book of Matthew, chapter 16 and verse 18, 
uh, I'm going to go ahead and read something here that currently tells us that this battle that we're that we're in is not a battle that we're is not a defensive battle only. It's it's an offensive uh, battle. It's that we are to take this and this battle to the enemy. And that's what the feet means is that we are to to go and spread the gospel. So notice in Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 it says, "And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church." And so Peter has just uh, proclaim that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said to him, he says, your name is Peter, meaning small pebble, but upon this rock, meaning himself, the church is going to be built. But notice what he says at the end. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, is the, is the gates of hell, are they a defensive weapon or an offensive weapon? It, it's, a, it's a defensive weapon. And what it's saying is, is that we're to be marching upon the gates of hell. We are to be marching upon those who are, um, that are, who are, who are um, have not accepted Christ. We're to march upon the enemy to free them from the, from the, the, the bounds of sin that has been uh, uh, put upon them by Satan. And that's why it says the gates of hell, the gates of Satan, right? He's de trying to defend against Christ coming in through us. And so... What it's telling us is that we are to advance the gospel. We are to share the gospel with everybody. And Romy was saying that it's the gospel of peace. Notice in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So we have peace through Jesus Christ. And, and that is the peace that God wants to give us. It's by accepting Christ as their Savior because it does not matter what you have done and it doesn't matter what you are going to do. When you have accepted Christ as your Savior, you have peace with God. No longer is there enmity. God knows all of the things that you're going to do that are not good, even after you accept him. But you are at peace with God because you are no longer a servant. You are a child of God. Matthew 24, verse 14 says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. This message is to go to the whole world. Because of the, we, we are to bring this message to the world. Revelation 14, verses 6 through 7 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Saying with a loud voice. You know what, I think I... I uh, Revelation 14, verse 6, I, I copied the wrong one. It says, um, in Revelation 14, verse 6, it says, um, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth the sea and the fountains of water. So my friends, my brothers and sisters, what it is saying is this um, gospel, this, uh, this, uh, that we're to prepare our feet with a gospel of peace means that we're to bring this gospel of peace, this peace that we have with Jesus, uh, with God through Jesus Christ to all that we come into contact with. The gospel is the true gospel that Jesus Christ is the only begotten son. Now that is very important. The gospel of peace can only be given to us through his son. And uh, 1 John 5 verse 11 says, And this is the record that God has given us everlasting life. And you can also put in there, he has given us peace. Uh, God has given us uh, everlasting life. And that life is in his son. That peace is in his son. That is what this is talking about. Now I'm going to move on, and I'm going to read. I'm going to have Bob, if you can read um, about the shield of faith, Ephesians chapter six, verse sixteen, and then I'm going to ask you uh, because I know that you have studied this a little bit, and just give us your take on it. With all, take up the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. That shield of faith, that is a piece of armor. That shield of faith. And here a few quarters ago, we studied the fiery darts of the evil one. 
His arrows are always shooting at us. And if we don't have that shield up there, the shield of faith that God can protect us, we're going to get hit like Saul did. A strange arrow flying out of, in the midst of nowhere, coming and getting between the armor. Yeah. And killed him. Well, it didn't kill him right then, but basically. It was unto death. Yeah, people will be, will be the, in the same situation because his arrows are constant. They're coming at us continuously. Like you said, from a movie or from TV or from the newspaper, it doesn't matter. They come at us. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the shield is primarily a defensive weapon. But, you know, it can also be an offensive weapon. Our faith shields us from the attacks of the enemy. Now, I think uh, I was reading in the commentary that it said that the fiery darts, right? Um, it says here, quench the fiery darts. Now, because um, it, it's not just an arrow that's trying to get us and hit us in the heart. It wants to continue to burn us. And so if, if you are hit with a fiery dart, then it's possible for you to get burned as well. So it has a lasting effect upon us. When we have a shield of faith, those fiery darts can go and hit the, the, the shield of faith. And a lot of times that was, you know, it was a wood that had, um, that was, it had um, edges, you know, of uh, metal or something like some kind of metal, maybe, I think the Romans, it was iron, right? So it was pretty heavy. But the wood was also pretty heavy. And when a fiery, arrow or dart would hit it it would it, it could not burn the the wood because it was just too uh i guess too strong and so this shield that is talking about is to protect us from those kinds of things but notice uh when we in the bible word that god or jesus talks about our faith as a shield from the attacks of the enemy just like what bob was saying in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, why don't you go ahead and turn, if you will, to Luke chapter um, 22, verses 31 and 32. And Jesus is speaking to Peter, and, he, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, and that he may sift you as wheat. Now, my friends, that is exactly what Satan wants for all of us. He, want, he desires to have us, to overcome us, to sip with this as wheat, to, to shake our faith in him or in Jesus. But notice what he says in verse 32. But I, Jesus says, have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brother. Now notice this. This shield of faith was supposed to be a defensive weapon against Satan because he desired to shake him as wheat. But Jesus said, he has prayed for them. So that is an example of, um, of a, a, de or a defensive weapon. But notice this. There is also an offensive um, capability to the shield of faith. When we talk about um, the faith of the Son of God, notice this. In 1 John 5, verse 4, Notice this. It says, For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory. Now notice this. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So our faith is, gives us victory. But let's see what it says in verse 5. What is that victory? It says in verse 5, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? My friends, our faith in the fact that Jesus is the Son of God is an offensive weapon against Satan. Is that it can give us the victory, or it will give us the victory over Satan. And here's another example of faith as an um, uh, offensive weapon. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, it says, um, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief... Now, Basically, Jesus has coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. He has with him um, Peter, James, and John. And they come upon the disciples, and the scribes and the Pharisees are there, and they have this, this young man that has been tormented 
with um, with a demon that he, the father the the father says that he would even throw himself in the fire as try, try to you know to try to kill him and so the disciples were trying to cast out this demon but they could not and um, the the scribes and the Pharisees were there mocking them because they had no power to cast out this demon and then of course Jesus comes and he casts out the demon and Jesus said unto them, because uh, they were asking, how is it that we could not do this? How come we couldn't cast out this, uh, this demon? And Jesus answers and said unto them, because of your unbelief. Now, these, um, our, their faith in Jesus was to be used to cast out the enemy. That was an offensive weapon. I think the one before that probably was more of a defensive weapon. But anyway, the point is, is that in this one is an offensive weapon. Their faith gave them strength to overcome the enemy. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it, uh, and it shall re remove, and nothing shall be impossible for you. How be it this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And so there's this preparation that we must have. Uh, this faith must be increased. And so what is the best way for us to increase our faith? Well, it's to, it's to um, trust in God in the small areas of your life that through his answered prayers, it will be strengthened for the, the more pr uh, pressing trials that come upon us. So to me, that's you know, very interesting. I mean, faith is so very important. Is, uh, our faith is what connects us to, um, to Jesus, right? Uh, what does the John three sixteen say? For God so loved the world uh, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth. Now another way of saying that is whosoever shall have faith, right, yeah. in Jesus, right, he shall not perish, but have perish, but have everlasting life. That's just absolutely beautiful. That we need the faith. Faith is is a very important part of our armor. You think about it, Wes. Think about Paul or Peter and John going to prayer meeting that night. Yep. And the lame man standing out the synagogue door. I have nothing to give you but the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up and walk. Amen. What kind of faith did he have? And yet he's been condemned, well, not condemned, rebuked several times by Jesus himself. Yep. But yet with that faith, he was able to lift that man up and that man walked into the synagogue with him he was able through his faith to um to overcome what satan was trying to accomplish in that man and yeah. if you notice all of the miracles that jesus did in healing people he said it's your faith the woman that was cured of her, her issue of blood for what 12 years he says thy faith has made thee whole to the centurion who demonstrated great faith um, he said, be, uh, be according to your faith. And so the promises of God and the answers to prayers that we pray for is in accordance to the faith that we exercise. Now, and faith is, it's only by our faith. That's right. I mean, we're going to see some, based on what my readings in Ellen White and the Bible says, I'm going to uh, go through a troublous times but if i don't have faith in christ i'm not going to get through so another way of looking at faith and faith is a bit deeper more spiritual but is you know a word is trust right yeah um i think i've used this story before um there is this man who is a renowned tightrope walker and i guess he put a tightrope i think it was over niagara falls or as a you know some place and um the crowd was saying, do you think I can do this? And they said, yes, I can, you can do this and everything like that. And he'd go over and come back and yay and everything. And then he got a wheelbarrow, of course, a special wheelbarrow that can be pushed on the wire. I think they just had the rim and no, um, no tire on it. And he says, do you believe I can push this wheelbarrow over without falling down? Yes, we believe, we believe and everything like that. And then he said, who wants to get in? Nobody wanted to get in right because they they claim that they had trust and faith that he can do it but
But when their life was on the line, none of them wanted to step right. up. Now, I think in the story that there was someone that finally did step up. But the point is, is that we, we say, oh, I trust in God, I trust in God, I trust in God. But then when the trials of life come, when our life is on the line, when our livelihood is on the line, when our family members are on the line, we, you know, our faith evaporates before our eyes. Because why is that? Because we have not the true shield of faith. We have not developed that relationship in Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to go into our last portion here. We're going to read verses 17 and verse 18. And I would, I would just remind you all, if you have questions or if you want to make a comment, you don't have to wait for me to call on you. You can just speak up. Um, I'm very happy to stop talking and let you share or ask a question that you would like. So just make sure that you, you do that. And because uh, sometimes I can get a little off track. So we're going to read um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. And uh, Joseph, I, I saw you once, but uh, are you there? Can you read Ephesians 6, verse 17? Uh, what's up, Ephesians? Yep, Ephesians 6, 17. 6, 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So what is, when you read this, brother, what do you, what do you think about it? I mean, what is it? What does it kind of bring to mind when it talks about this helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit? Hmm. I think, um, hmm. Hmm. that Jesus is with us, the Holy Spirit, and throughout the Word of God, in our minds, within in our hearts. Yeah, yeah. What do you think the significance is of the helmet of salvation? Uh -huh. your mindset yeah your mindset is is one of it um i mean where where is the where is the center of your will it's in your head right it's in your it's in your it's in your mind right what did what did um um paul say to the philippians let this mind be in you which is also in christ jesus and so if you think about the head, the head is, it's a vital part of us. Um, if we get hit in the head, um, you know, we can become unconscious, you know, we can, um, um, you know, we can die, right? You know, most of the time when you hear somebody getting shot in the head, you know, that's pretty much a fatal thing. Um, people can get hit in the head and it can cause a concussion and it can kill them. So we really need to uh, protect our head, our mind. Now you think about it, there are people that have, have um, had damage to the prefrontal cortex, the front part of their brain, and they have lived, but um, their whole life has changed. Um, they're, I mean, they, they became a completely different person. So we need to protect our minds. And how do we protect our minds? Now, you remember, this is, a, this is not a physical battle that we're in. I mean, there's physical aspects of, to it. But we need to protect our minds. What did Ellen White say? She says, guard well the avenues to the soul, right? And that comes through what we you know, hear, what we mean, what we listen to, what we eat, what we watch, what we allow to come into our minds, right? Because we are very influenced by that which we see. Um, so we need to protect our minds. We need to protect it against yes. the, the, the Satan. The Satan. Go ahead, brother. Were you going to say something? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I thought I thought you yeah. were going to say something, uh, Romy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, where are we now? We're in Seven. verse seventeen. Yes. It talks about the helmet of salvation. Uh, actually, just like what you are saying that. A helmet protects the head. And what is the most important thing in the head? It is the frontal lobe. 
because it is the it is the seat of decision it is the seat of judgment and so we have to protect we have to be able to make the right decisions to make the right judgment and or in order for that to be protected we should always have to to decide of our salvation to judge accordingly to what uh, uh, God has been trying to uh, give to us and to all the people of the world that it is his will to save everybody in this world and, but the condition for that is for our will to be submissive to him and to his son Jesus Christ and where just the willpower for that to be accomplished comes from, it is through our mind, which is in our frontal lobe. It should be always our decision. It should always be our will to be saved because that is the will of God for us, for us to be saved. And uh, going back also to the shield of faith, it actually, this one, the shield of faith is actually referring to the faith of Jesus. It is true that our belief and trust in Jesus is our faith. But the faith that has gained victory, the faith that is triumphant over the world already, over the enemy, is the faith of Jesus Christ. It says in the book of Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, that knowing that a man is not justified, by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. This is the only kind of faith that we need to attain, to obtain in order for us to be able to be saved. And that kind of faith Christ is willing to impart to us. Yeah. Maybe you have heard about those theological statements where it says imparted and imputed imputed and imparted righteousness. And so the faith of Jesus Christ is the one that we need now. Once we accept and believe in Jesus Christ our, our, as our personal Savior, then he is willing to impart to us his faith, a faith that is victorious. A faith that is triumphant. The only kind of faith that will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's why the Apostle Paul says in verse 20 of Galatians chapter 2, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. So in verse 17 now of the armor of God, actually in summary, in short summary, actually the armor of God is actually about Jesus Christ. These are all the characteristics. It is referring to all the characteristics of Jesus Christ, who being obedient unto death, has exemplified, has revealed to us, has manifested to us what victory over sin is all about what a triumphant and victorious life is all about. And we can all gain that, obtain that through Jesus Christ. And so we have to guard the helmet, the, the, the mind, our mind, which is the uh, seat of decision, of judgment, so that our only desire should be our salvation, which can be found only in Jesus Christ. For God has given his only begotten son that we may have eternal life and which is the word of God the, the, and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God and we can only learn this we can only come to know about this through the word of God this is the only way where we can stand against the wiles of the devil Jesus has withstood this in his temptation in the wilderness it, that is always his answer it is written it is written that is how he overcame the devil. That's why the devil has nothing to prove, anything to prove uh, to him because he has gained the victory. And so we have to 
uh, exemplify and to manifest the same kind uh, of spirit that Jesus Christ has exemplified. And he is always willing to impart this kind of a victory to us. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing, brother. You know, you kind of I appreciate those texts you brought out. And it's interesting that at the very end of the three angels' message in Revelation 14, verse 12, it says, um, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so Amen. it means that they have the whole armor of God. Praise God for that. Thank you for sharing. Now, I'd like to focus on the second aspect of that verse where it talks about the sword of the Spirit. Now, many, many focus on the sword of the Spirit as being only the Word of God. And, you know, while the sword of the Spirit certainly is the Word of God, it's more than that. Now, you think, because it's talking about um, in verse uh, 17, it says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And, you know, we think about that as the Word of God. Yes, it's the Scriptures. But our relationship, our righteousness, do not come from the Scriptures. Our righteousness does not come from the written Word of God. It leads us to something. All of the words of the Bible leads us to this relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so when it says, take the sword of the Spirit, it's talking about taking the righteousness of Christ, Christ living in you, just like what um, uh, Brother Romy was reading in Galatians chapter 3, verse 20, talking about um, Paul. He says, he says, I live, yet uh, not I, but Christ liveth within me. And so this is what it's talking about here, the sword of the Spirit. If we have Christ living within us, we will have that victory, right? Victory comes through Christ, because Christ has already gained the victory. It's a foregone conclusion. You don't bet against Christ because Christ always wins. Now, if we have Christ living within us, we also will have that victory. And so um, what gives life to the Word of God is Jesus Christ. You can read a text today, and, it'll, and, it, and it comes across one way, and you read a text uh, next week when something's different going on in your life, and Christ may speak to you in a different way. But the Word of God is living only through Christ. And so the sword of the Spirit is not just the Scriptures. It is Christ living within us. And I think that's an important part that we want to, want to, to note. And our last verse comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. And um, let's go ahead and go back to Kathy. Uh, can you read this last verse, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18? Sorry. Okay. Ephesians 6, 18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. What do you think about nice that? Verse. Oh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's wonderful news. It also tells us to pray for each other. Yeah. yeah. I like that. So, you know, prayer, and all kinds of prayer requests, it can be anything, you know, um, I've learned even when I was in Maryland, I remember I, I didn't know how to do wooden floors and I, I, I prayed about it and, uh, and God, <laughs> God helped me. I, I did it in two days. I was like, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing what God can do. Yeah. And, you know, prayer, when you think about it, prayer is us communicating directly with God. And God speaks to us through the Word of God, but He also speaks to us through answered prayers, exactly what you're talking about there. So prayer is like life to the soul. It's our communication with God. Prayer is not just another weapon. Rather, it is the spirit, the manner in which the whole, and I'm, and I'm sorry, I'm reading from the, from the, um, the um, um, SDA Bible commentary. It says, prayer is not another weapon. Rather, it is the spirit, 
the manner in which the whole armor is to be worn and the battle fought. Paul is here urging it is a perpetual state of mind, a continuous attitude of communion with God. Now, one of the most important things, you know, when, when I was in the, in the military is our ability to communicate between one another. One of the things that they would say is, uh, or the phrases they would use is, shoot, move, communicate. So communication was very important. That's why they invest lots of money in sophisticated radios so that they communicate with one another, so that they can coordinate this attack. And so how are we to be able to do what God wants us to do if we are not communicating with him? if we're not opening this channel and being continually um, open to hearing and the word of God speaking to us. And so prayer is that, um, is that medium. Notice I got three verses, uh, two texts to go to, and then we'll be done. So go to Philippians chapter four, verses six and seven. And uh, uh, brother Chris, if you're there and, and are able to do so, can you read? Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. You're going to have to unmute yourself if you're there. Yep. Well, we can't hear you, so maybe you're not uh, able to read at this point. Okay, um, maybe we'll go on then. I'll ask Brother Eric. Can you read Philippians chapter four, verses six and seven? Okay. Um, okay, Philippians four, six and seven. Don't worry about anything, instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Yeah. What do you think about that text? How does that make you feel? Uh, it's, a, it's a refreshing one. <laughs> it's, uh, it's knowing that, uh, that he's always going to be there and um, in his ears. And he's uh, all ears and always available, you know. Um, yeah, which is, uh, which is very encouraging. And um, yeah. Uh, it just goes to show, uh, just like just like any parent being there for for their own kids, you know. Um, yeah, it's really um, it's awesome, awesome news. It is, you know. In in this verse, God is 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 requesting us, asking us, and inviting us to talk with Him, to seek Him out. He says, um, "Be careful for nothing, but in everything." by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, and let your request be made known to God. And the last verse comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. And this, to me, really kind of brings it home when it talks about communicating with God, is that, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we try to talk to people, and, you know, sometimes they're not in the mood to listen to us, or maybe they're too busy or something like that. And it's interesting when I hear some of my brothers and sisters who are in different faiths, you know, they pray to, you know, to Mary or they pray to Joseph because, and one of their reasonings is, is, you know, that Jesus, you know, he's very busy, you know, so we pray to Mary and then Mary will take it to Jesus, right? And, you know, but that's not what the Bible says. It says uh, in Hebrews chapter four, verse 16, it says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so when we need God, he is never too busy. When you think about Peter, when he was walking on the water, Jesus invited him to come out and walk on the water. And when he turned around and he started to, you know, have pride in his heart and say, hey, look at me type thing, he realized that he was seeking, sinking. And he said very shortly, Lord, save me. And immediately he was saved. Immediately Jesus reached down and, and took hold of him. My friends, when we pray that prayer, Lord, save me. Oh, my friends, he is so willing and able to save us. But we need to ask, Lord, save me. My friends, that's what all of us need, is salvation. And when we say, Lord, save me, he is so happy and so willing and so able to reach down and save us. No matter what predicament we are in. He will save us. And so today, when we're talking about this 
armor of God. This armor of God can only be given by the Son of God. If we have a armor that is coming from any other source, it is not the armor of God. And when the time of test and trial comes, that um, facade of an armor will not protect us. It will evaporate before our eyes. And so this um, the putting on the whole armor of God means to put upon us Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And I'd like to, to take our last verse that just came to mind is in the book of uh, John. And it kind of comes from what we were talking about a couple weeks ago. So go to chap uh, John chapter um, 20 and verses 30 and 31. And this kind of sums it all up. It says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But notice in verse 31, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. My friends, the whole armor of God is to accept Christ into your life the only begotten Son of God. And that, to me, is the beauty of this, this message, that, um, you know, the whole armor of God. Anybody have any, uh, any okay. thoughts or Look questions? At Esther. Look at the book of Esther. Yep. What did she do? She went boldly before the throne of the king. We're going before both the king ourselves, the universal king. And that king was her husband. What's our king? Yeah. Are we the bride of Christ? Yep. Compare the two. Exactly, exactly what she did, we're supposed to be doing. Now, when she went before the throne, when she went before her husband, now, of course, the king of Persia had many wives. I mean, a, a harem of wives. And anybody that went into the presence of the king uninvited was looked upon as suspicion, like they were going to try to kill him. And therefore, if you presented yourself to the king without an invitation, you are risking your life because they could put you to death. Now, when we think of God, the, the, the ruler of the whole, the whole universe, he says, come boldly to the throne of God. There is no reservations. If we are the child of God, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. There is no restriction for us. There is nothing that, you know, that God is not too busy. He's not engaged in any, anything more important than to take care and save of his children. And so that is what God wants us to do. But we can only do so through accepting Christ as our Savior. Thank you for that, Bob. Anybody else have anything, last words, before we um, close this, um, this study off? Okay. Brother Romy? Yes, Jesus is the only answer. Yeah. He is the only answer. And, you know, when I, when I prefaced this in the beginning, you know, when it talked about that there was a counterfeit um, righteousness, that there was a counterfeit armor, it made sense because um, this really, this armor can only come from one being. There's one being in the whole universe that this armor can come from. And it can only come from Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It can't come from God the Son, because God the Son is not the Son of God. <laughs> That's just the way it is. And so we have to have the genuine, because if we have the genuine, we will not have a form of godliness. We will have the righteousness of God himself. Does that make sense? All right. Thank you, um, everyone, for, for being here today. And does anybody have any questions? Um, anything, any, anything else before we close? All right. So why don't we um, uh, bow our heads and um, let's ask uh, or thank the Lord for, in fact, you know what? Brother Romy, could you close, you know, have our closing prayer? Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, once again, what a wonderful 
time that you have given to us that we may learn once more from the truth of your word that it is only through your son Jesus Christ whom you have given to us, for us, that we can have eternal life. And it is only through him who has gained the victory, who has gained uh, the power over all the forces of evil that uh, can bring us back into uh, righteousness, into right living, into harmony with uh, you. Father in heaven, we are so thankful once again for this blessed Sabbath day because we have been given the time to have rest from our toil and labor, daily toil and labor. And we can come together uh, as one to study your word. Father in heaven, thank you so much. May each and every one of us receive all the blessings that you have bestowed to us from your throne. Thank you once again. And may we all experience the peace that passes understanding, the life that you have given to us through your son, Jesus Christ, and that we can gain the victory uh, over sin and every beset, besetting our uh, wiles of the enemy. Thank you, Father in heaven, once again, and be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.